really like I would want you to just real briefly just telling the history and like why why you're so interested in this, how you got because you came from Louisiana and mm -hmm. came out to California. Yeah. And, you know what got you interested in sustainability because your background isn't necessarily that. So no, my background isn't that. My background, um, I came from college educated, yeah. uh, white middle class, you know, in the deep south. So living in a bubble, yeah. not necessarily connecting with the world at large, and this was in the 70s and the 80s. But um, I come from a long line of gadgety people, people who are tool users, problem solvers, engineering minded kinds of people, scientifically minded kinds of people, which I, I realize now looking back that I was raised in a relatively progressive family for the part of the country where I grew up. Just, there was, there was never like this thing, oh, you're a girl, you can't do that. Right. That's not a girl thing. Right. My mom's a scientist, so that guy, that wasn't going to fly in our house. Um, so I got exposed to those kinds of things and watching my dad, and my dad would involve me in a lot of his projecting thing. And so I was exposed to all of that. But it also made me a weirdo and a freak, and I didn't fit in with all the Beckys that I yeah. grew up with. Yeah. And so I was also the nerd that got picked on. And um, and I was a kid making D's and F's in GATE, because even though I was a gifted student, I was also a disabled student. Okay. And nobody was dealing with that part of it. It's like, oh, you're so smart, you just need to try harder. And so that's what got me into special ed as an adult, okay. supporting all of those kinds of that's things. That's awesome. I love that. So my roundabout way and on the sustainability part of it, I've always been in, in, interested in and all of that because I've as you know going through my classes and everything and all the college the, the higher education I've had um, I've always been exposed to this is what's going on in the world these are the things that people don't want to deal with so they're acting like it's not really happening you know this is you know when you're studying psychology you learn about this the science of denial they get bombarded with too many bad things and they'll just shut down and act like none of it's happening because they can't process it all at yeah. once yeah. and so then they don't deal with their problems and so um you know how do you deal with that as a society how do you create systems that are going to encourage people to think in in healthy ways okay. and, and the, in productive ways and then you know on the flip side of it i don't really bring my faith into it a lot but uh not verbally but, you know, I very much feel like this is a calling for me to speak to the things that are troubling our world. And regardless of where you stand politically, because the work I do in special ed is highly politicized, I need a, an escape from that. Okay. I need something in my life that isn't that. Yeah. Everybody needs to eat. Your belief system is irrelevant to your survival needs. Okay. And so if I can speak to the things we all have in common, then that gives me a, a, a greater opportunity to speak truth to knowledge, speak truth to power, and let people figure things out for themselves rather than telling them what they should think. I just want to put things in front of people so they can figure it out on their own and yeah. take ownership of the realization. Right. You know, rather than it's like, believe me because I told you. No, here's the facts, go sort it for yourself. Right. And um, so I'm very much about that. And so a lot of that comes from my background in special ed. And so when I was in my uh, final semester of my master's program in 2013, my uh, final semester I had to take a class called Instructional Design. And we had to take a concept, a teaching concept, and turn it into an educational product. I'm already running a nonprofit organization at this point, so I'm like, well, if I'm going to do it for great, I'm going to do it for real. I mean, there's no reason to yeah. go through all of this work just for a letter on a, yeah. who cares? And yeah, so, yeah. I'm like, this is like a requirement. I got to do this no matter what, so I might as well make something out of it for me and make it a real thing. And so that's what I did, and I built the whole thing around food security and urban gardening and people who live in places who um, where they have no open ground for growing, or if they do, they're not allowed to use it. You know, right. like a renter might be in a house, but they can't. Or what happens if you rent the house for six months and you put a garden in and now you got to move yeah. and you can't take it with you. And so... Um, so I was looking at it from that standpoint, but also looking at it from a, a poverty, hunger relief, food security solution for people. Because you have like Ron Finley down in, in South Central LA, yes, yes. Um, where he's converting all these empty lots into growing spaces. Well, that's in a city that has lots of empty lots, yeah. but not all cities have lots of empty lots. And what do you do if you're someplace that that's just not an option for you? And even internationally, you've got a lot of people that are... Here. Right, like our folks in Egypt who are you know, uh, building more and more upward to cling to the banks of the, the Nile 
and stay and becoming more and more urban because they can't spread out. And so, um, you know, we realize that we've got these different audiences of people. And it's interesting the different parts of the country and what the demographics are. If you look at our demographics for who's following us in like Central and South America, it's older women. That's because of our video with Isabel. Oh, okay. Um, uh, then you look at who's following us in Egypt, it's all, uh, it's both genders, but it's younger people. And then, the yeah, like the Gen Zers. Yeah. And then you get into um, different places, and it's like in the United States, it's middle-aged women. You know, and so it just really yeah. depends on where you are and, and who's receptive to the message and who's, who does it resonate with. But um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, the more I expose teenagers and young adults to what I'm doing, the, it, it deeply resonates with them. They get it a lot more than some of our older folks who, you know, regardless of what we're doing out here, they have a house that's paid for. Yeah. And they, they don't, these are not, not their issues. But still, I mean, I, you know, with us, with Grow Bucket, there's people that like to be down in the dirt, you know, in their gardens, and they get older. And they can You know, can't. We've had, we had a, a neighbor that we took grow buckets over to. So we put those buckets up on the table, and he was able to make these, you know, tomatoes and peppers and just have them on his patio, and it made a lot of our, With our community service projects that we're doing through the Kiwanis Club, we're looking at nursing homes and adult daycares and preschools yeah. and places like that. And um, I, at one point in time, I was going to do a program, state's most progressive senior care programming. It's a special district that's devoted specifically to aging. Okay. And Camarillo has a lot of seniors here. We have an entire retirement community, Leisure Village, is just right over here. Okay. And um, so we have a lot of seniors here. And so the healthcare district has a, an adult daycare program for Alzheimer's care for folks. And a lot of those folks still remember gardening. They remember doing the victory gardens back yeah, during the yeah, war and all exactly. that kind of stuff. And a lot of times for your dementia patients, um, those old memories from a long time ago are still there, especially for procedural things where it's, you remember how to do something. You might not remember who taught you or when it happened, but somehow the knowledge of the skill is still there. Yeah. And so it's interesting to see that you will put something familiar like that in front of a senior. And maybe they can't get on their hands and knees and garden anymore. Maybe they are in a wheelchair and they need something that's just right in front of them. But as soon as they see that tomato plant, lights come on that's and they awesome. and they're just in there, you know. Yeah. And it's like, okay, you know, and it gives them something to do. And we were looking at doing an intergenerational thing with a local preschool where um, the kids could come in and the seniors could teach them. So yeah. even though they're, they have dementia, they still have yeah. knowledge to pass on and they're still doing productive, useful things. And not feeling, you know, oh, I just have to be stuck in this chair until the day, you know, exactly. the pearly gates come. You know, and right. so um, I, it's it's interesting to see all the different ideas that we've been, you know, able to create around all of this. Right. The pandemic really messed us up for a lot of this in-person stuff. Right. But we're starting to get to the point now where we're going to be able to start doing that again. Yeah. And um, so starting out with the the schools because we the Kiwanis Club has youth membership organizations at the school sites so we're going to have our kids build their own gardens at their schools that's step one they learn how it all works they go through a growing season they get a sense of how it all is now they can start targeting nursing homes and preschools and other places where a community garden might be valuable and they can go in and build one for someone else okay. and um, with our school uh, our first garden that we put in over at university prep charter school um, I was going through the whole presentation before we even went outside to put everything together and I'm talking about how they can get buckets used from restaurants if they can, you know, source them. And the student teacher goes, my husband's the assistant manager of In-N-Out. Yeah, I've got perfect. you covered. For pickles. Like, yeah. And so all the kids now have to come up with when they go build gardens for other people are the kits as opposed to the buckets, yeah. which are more expensive, honestly, especially with the supply chain issues. Now. Right. But actually, you know, we can go around the like all the different restaurants and we'll do that. Yeah. But now the kids are going to have a bucket drive that oh, they can okay. do to, to collect all the buckets. And, and then they can, part of their statistics is going to be how many buckets that we keep from a landfill. Yeah. You okay, know? cool. And yeah. so there's a recycling component right. to it. And now they're learning about water conservation and capillary action right. and sub irrigation yeah. and all the science. And their teacher is like, oh, this is the coolest thing ever. Yeah. And, um, and but because we already have a presence online, We've already got 52,000 uh, learners on Facebook. I know, you we, really have a big group on there. Um, 
I have a friend in Egypt who started that. Yeah. Honestly, he shared it out with friends of his, and I only had like 400 followers. Uh -huh. And all of a sudden, I'm getting all these this traffic from Egypt. I'm like, what the heck is going on? Yeah. And I'm like, this is this you? I'm like, you're the only person I know in Egypt. <laughs> yeah. And he was like, yeah, I shared it out. I'm like, well, obviously, your friend shared it out wow. again because yeah. it kind of went micro viral. Okay. And then I put $5 uh, dollars worth of Facebook ad money behind it, and I doubled my like page likes um, from 400 something to like 1200 something yeah. in like four days. Okay. Uh, and like five bucks went that far. Yeah. Um, when the Venezuelan food crisis hit in 2016 and Isabel and I did our first do it your the DIY version how to video. Mm -hmm. um, because all of a sudden the traffic on the back end of our site for the how to stuff jumped up. Yeah. And um, I'm like, what's going on in Venezuela? You know, <laughs> and Google it. And we're like, oh God, you know, and so um, yeah. putting $5 of Facebook ad money behind something like that to help people feed themselves in a collapsing economy, wow. Yeah. So now my next thing is going to be to do another video how-to kind of a thing um, and push it to the, the countries around Ukraine that are accepting the refugee populations. Oh, okay. Because, again, I mean, people got to be able to take their food with them if they're mobile. Yeah. And you've got to be able to grow food on the fly if you can't truck it all in. Yeah. And I, I think that things are going to get worse before they get better. And I think we're going to go through a lot of tumultuousness around the world. And we're going to see our commercialized systems that we've become so dependent upon realize how fragile they are. And what started out as a convenience became something that that's what people rely on for survival. And more and more people are like, I, I can't do that. I I've got to be able to have something else other than the store. Yeah. You know, and I mean, so that's already happened through, through the whole thing. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, because we went, I went to the grocery store about a month before we left, and there was no chicken anywhere, you know, and there was all, all of a sudden there's all this plant-based yeah. product out there, which is fine, but it's just like, you're what? This has never happened, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. Oh, well, now you've got a, a bird flu run going on the East Coast right now. Oh, I don't know. Getting, getting all the chickens sick, and they're like, be careful, all my chicken oh. feeds on, on Instagram. I remember before. that back in the early, is it the late 80s, early 90s? Yeah. My stepdad was, he worked at a feed company. Yeah. And that, that was horrible. And it's all the factory farming chickens, yeah, but it, yeah. can, it can be spread by wild birds to like my little girls it could be, if they were back east that could happen to yeah. them and so yeah. you know I'm gonna say with your Kiwanis endeavor mm -hmm. like tell us how we might be able to help with that or explain oh absolutely so the way that we're doing the, the program with Kiwanis is the clubs sponsor these community gardens and so you have like the Kiwanis Club of Camarilla which is the club that I belong to yeah. and then we've got all of our youth organizations at the different school sites where that's been done that are supported by our club and so these are our volunteers now a lot of our club members are retired they're older folks so they have time on their hands but we can't give them to things that are too physically demanding right. or taxing so the grow bucket thing is like perfect especially since we can delegate so much of it to the kids like sourcing the buckets and the social media part of it and all right. of that right. um, and the hands-on of going out and building things so what we're doing is we already have some club funds that were already dedicated to community service projects that the club had already raised. So we've already got about, I think, like twelve or $1,400 committed to this project. So we're buying the Grow Bucket kits through the Learn and Grow online store so that Learn and Grow as a nonprofit organization gets some kind of financial support for the part of the program we're doing. And then um, the Kiwanis is getting all the material, the, the soil, the buckets, the, everything else. And then the kids go out and build these gardens. And um, then what we can also do if we're, we don't have enough money in budget. Um, when I was, when I first joined the club years and years and years ago, um, we had a 5K, 10K run. And what we would do is we had a program that would be in the goodie bag with all the donated, yeah, you know, the grab bags, of all the, yeah, all the, all the swag. And from all the different advertisers and so what we would also do is is in the program we would sell ads in the back of it so like $25 for a business card size ad right. you know quarter page whatever and so um, then we also had signage along the race route through town so to mark the route we had to have our signage up so we would sell advertising on the signs 
and so that was our fundraiser and then that would cover the cost of running the race along with the fees of, from the runners um, and then give us extra money that we would then turn into scholarships for graduating high school seniors. So I'm like, why don't we do the same thing? We'll just sell ads on the sides of the buckets. I'll NASCAR these babies, I don't care. <laughs> And, um, and I've got these Mylar uh, labels, laser printer labels, that we can get people's marketing messages mm -hmm. and run them through a color laser printer and then smack them on the side of the bucket. And so this garden was sponsored by so-and-so insurance agency or so-and-so real estate agency. So we could get corporate sponsors to help pay for the cost of putting one of these community gardens in. Uh -huh. And they get a charitable donation because our Kiwanis Club is a 501c3. And so, um, and also with the materials that get donated, that's an in-kind donation, so people can write that off on their right, taxes. Right. And so we give people a mechanism to contribute to it and support, you know, make sure everybody has the materials, and then the kids and the, and the club members go out and do the gardens. And so um, that's the model we've created. Realize this, but people who are on food stamps can also buy seeds. Oh, you can okay. buy the USDA oh, is who, cool. yeah, who is, the food stamps are funded by the USDA. Yeah. And they would much rather you spend that money on a packet of seeds. And so if we can go through our local food banks, and here we have food share, um, and it's a, a faith-based thing, it's with gleaners of the field and all of that. We have so many fields around here. Uh -huh. And so we have the gleaners of the field who go around and collect and then, so um, very interesting the way that it's done around here. But um, we want to get to the point where we're giving away self-watering container gardens to people who are apartment bound or mobile home park bound or mobile. At the food bank? At the food oh, that's bank. That's a cool idea. And then turn them on to where they can buy their seeds with their food stamps and even have it all set up where they could possibly do it. And um, then do you have a nursery of any sort that's kind of teaming with you like for soil or? No, I just go to the hardware store and get stuff. But now, okay. um, and we I didn't really show you when we were walking through, but we can look at it in a minute, but I've got a vermiculture composter. Okay. And so all of my soil is dosed with earthworms and goop from the vermiculture composter. Yeah. And then all of the wastewater from the sink and the, the camping shower gets run through the composter um, or, or it gets fed to the trees, but usually it gets run through the composter and I just dump it in all the buckets. And so we have zero wastewater with, the, with the doing it that way. And then we have a composting toilet system, so there's no sewage, there's no black water, and then we have these waste bins behind my car where lined up where we put the waste from the, the composting toilet. Let it sit for about eight, nine months. At least six months is safe to put on the trees, but it takes us longer than that to go through them, so good enough. And so once uh, one of the bins gets full, the next one in sequence just gets emptied and it's used to fertilize the trees. And so, wow. There's, this is a closed system, and so all the kitchen and cooking scraps go into the go to the chickens. If it doesn't go into a chicken's tummy, it goes into the composter. The, all the eggshells go into the composter, coffee grounds, um, all the ash from the wood burning stove when I have to clean it out, goes into the bins with from the composting toilet. Okay. And so that creates the potassium, the potash, and all of that. So if you mix um, nitrogen rich compost with with ash it will make a really really rich comp fertilizer okay. um, and so I'm not I'm throwing away almost nothing and I'm just repurposing everything and and if I'm going to water the garden I try to, to use the water for something else first uh -huh. like washing something right and um, and then I'm recycling the water and so even when I have to use water to clean I'm not it's not just gonna go away down yeah. the drain somewhere it's all yeah. gonna go to, to proper use and so I, being able to model that here is actually a really cool thing, you know, yeah, that and yeah. it's like, okay, well, this isn't a hypothetical anymore. Yes, you're actually doing it. I'm actually doing it. I'm like, well, this is easy. And that's really what I, well, I'm wanting to get to people is that how easy it is. And it just because it's different, it shouldn't be scary. And people have this fear of the unknown. Yeah. And you know, from my training in psychology, I know that anxiety is always about lack of predictability. Right when you don't know what's about to happen next, you become anxious. Right. And so people try to stick to what's familiar because it keeps things predictable. It, it's a, a anxiety management strategy. But the problem can become that you stick to the familiar longer than it's good for you because you just don't want to have to deal with the change and that fear of the unknown. Right. And I think that for me was the biggest thing I had to overcome. So going through the various different hardships that I've had to go through in the last few years has forced the issue. I don't get to chicken out. Yeah. 
Yeah. I don't get to walk away from the problem. I have to solve it. <laughs> and so I'm like, all right, I'll figure it out. And so I have. Well, and it's cool that you're sharing, you know, what you know with other people. Well, yeah. I mean, what's the point of going through something and learning something that other people are struggling with? Right. And I know I'm not the only one. I know I'm not the only one with an advanced degree who is struggling financially in this economy. Right. And, you know, I'm not willing to go out and take the food out of somebody else's baby's mouth in order to have more than what I need. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of ethics involved in, in, in making decisions in terms of, of uh, you know, how you're going to, to, to meet your resource needs. And a lot of people don't understand that all of these systems that we rely upon in our society, money, borders, laws, all of these things are invented by people. They're not physical, tangible things. It's, it's what rules we've created for ourselves to organize our lives. But as things change, we've got to adapt those rules to fit those changes. And not everybody, uh, you know, you've got to get everybody on the same page. And right now we've got everybody so confused yeah. as to what is. Right, right. And so I'm like, okay, well, I guess really the first, as, as an instructor, the first step is how do you figure out what is? What is the truth? You know, and so I've got to back up, and this is where my legal training comes in, where you just black and white with the facts, man, kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. And um, so it's been, it's you know, and the, this is where my ADHD is becomes a gift as opposed to a disability, because people with ADHD um, do not think in straight lines. We think in tree branches. Yeah. And we will notice all of the random crap in the periphery and miss the obvious by a freaking <laughs> mile. And But eventually we'll come back around like, oh, hey, do you realize? And it's like, we've been waiting for you to catch up with us. Yeah. But in the meantime, I will have picked up all of this superfluous, seemingly superfluous data along the periphery. And then I'm like, do you realize that do, 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 all of these things are connected and bam, you know? And everybody's like, how did you do that? Yeah. I'm like, how did you not? You know, yeah. and so yeah. it, it, it's... Being, not being neurotypical is a blessing in disguise. It was a hardship for most of my life, but I'm now 55 years old. I figured a few things out, and I'm at the point now where I know how to use the way my brain works to my advantage and to the advantage of the people I'm trying to help. And so making these connections between all of the things I've learned working on the legal side of the universe and working in, in uh, educational psychology and best practices and instruction and understanding how to make an evidence-based argument mm -hmm. rather than coming across as a screaming hysterical meanie. Mm -hmm. um, all of those little random bits and pieces actually mean something. Yeah. And everything's interconnected. And if you start to realize the relationships, then you know where I come in is I'm supplementing the data set with all the stuff that everybody else missed. I'll let everybody else worry about the obvious. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> And I'll just come up with, you know, I'm the Christmas tree lights after everything else. Is up. But, um, you know, I'm very good at putting the, the flesh on the bones once I've got the bones figured out. And so uh, the same problem solving skills that I use for teaching are the same ones I use out here to figure, okay, what am I going to do? Yeah. And I'm like, well, this is just a translatable skill. This is just general problem solving. It's not industry specific. Right. And so I, I've gotten better at generalizing those skills and not thinking of them as so siloed. And I, I, I really, I think that what we have to offer that's different is because we're trying to get inside of people's heads to the real issues of why are we in this situation in the first place? This is about solving a problem so you don't end up starving your butt off because yeah, yeah. things go bad and, and having a backup plan. And, um, and so a lot more people are coming around to that right now just because of everything we're all going through. And then we have people who are already struggling who don't know what to do for themselves and see this as like, oh my God. So are you connecting with those people more just through that Facebook group, or how are you connecting with You know, people? Facebook isn't as, I mean, it, I get a lot of looky-loos through Facebook. I get more interaction through Instagram, even though I have much smaller, I was about 3,200 on the Learn and Grow one. But they're more engaged. But they're more engaged. Um, they tend to be um, institutional accounts. So oh, it'll be okay. like an NGO in Uganda that's serving thousands of people, oh, cool. or okay. so it's not... 3,200 followers gotcha. is 3,200 accounts, bearing in mind that a lot of those accounts are institutional and represent thousands of people apiece and schools and different things like that. So I, I, we're getting more of that kind of an attention on Instagram. And what seems to be getting us the most traction right now is our meetup group for the Learning Growth stuff. 
I've got over 300 members in our meetup group and I've never advertised at once. Oh, okay. Um, my special ed group has like nine members and nobody ever shows up to work meetups. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I've always got people in the learning growth stuff and so people are interested in this. People yeah. are like looking for the information and the more urban they are, I know that when um, we did our, pro our project for Venezuela in 2016, and we ran the ads and, and uh, pushed that marketing message, the how-to. We were using social media marketing to push instruction rather than sales, but it's the same psychology. And we got this tearjerker message back, a DM back from some guy in uh, Caracas. T1 internet, high-rise penthouse, no open ground for growing. And he goes, I did not know what I was gonna do. And then I saw your thing. I was like, oh my God, I'm saved. Awesome. And to even know that one person yeah. going through something as god awful as that yeah. looked at what I was doing and said, "Oh, you just saved my butt." You know, yeah. I mean, yeah. knowledge That's is power, cool. that yeah. kind of a thing. And I was like bawling my eyes out when I saw that because I mean, it was just so it was such an emotional message. Yeah. I'm not gonna lie, I had zombie apocalypse inclinations, worrying about stuff when I started all of this. I totally did. And I was like, hopefully in my lifetime, I will never see that this was justified. And well, I then, mean, and then, then it's Venezuela always, yeah, the prepper, the prepper mentality, and um, there is a lot of talk about that as a possibility, you know, with what's going on right now. Well, so. and I, I was a Girl Scout leader, and that whole be prepared thing, I'm yeah. like, hello, and, um, you know, you got to be prepared for contingencies, and that's not a, that's not a political thing, that's a smart people thing, that, yeah. it doesn't matter what direction you lean yeah. in politically, you just got to be smart, yeah. and, um, so, I mean, what does logic dictate? And so I think that it's been interesting because it's been the conversation that's unifying, that cults, cuts across all of the cultural divides. Yeah. That, you know, no matter what you believe and what your inclinations are, we all got to eat. Yep. And it's... I've I, had I think, that conversation with some people recently because, you know, there's some differences in opinion on what products you should use. And, you know, we've got competitors and, and I've just always said, hey, you know what, I, it doesn't, I'm not, I'm fine with people using something else, you know, if that's what they want to use, it's, it's trying to encourage people to grow their grow own. Grow your own food, that's the point. Yeah, yeah, so if, it, if it's, if they're using something else, great, yeah. you know, that's why you do your DIY thing, mm -hmm. but sometimes I've found with, you know, and we've talked to cannabis growers too, the same kind of thing where they're trying to grow, people grow their own medicine and, yeah. but that product that building that just as simple as it is for you to do that somebody it's just too much for other it's people. an obstacle and so then they never do it exactly it's, it's intimidating they never do it so the grow bucket comes in and goes oh everybody automatically defaults to the grow bucket yeah. when given a choice do you want to do the diy version yeah. or do you want to do the grow bucket version yeah. they automatically go to the grow bucket and version people will say you know the cost of it but it's like if you start talking about a couple buckets in the parts that you have to get and hole saws and, and i mean and yeah drill the t and the time and the mess yeah and the, yeah so, so yeah. and and they are you know they last forever with, i mean you know, yeah i mean reusing them that's yeah well the same thing yeah with my diys that the buckets will crap out before the drains and the yeah. pvc will and there's certain buckets that you know not to get now because they crumble <laughs> i won't name them but yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. but um yeah do you do you end up just fortifying the, the soil that you have or do you end up taking your plants and taking the soil out and uh, putting new soil in. I haven't, I haven't replaced anything. I've supplemented yeah. and because I've got earthworms in every bucket, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's become a living ecosystem inside yeah, of cool. there. Okay. And so the earth stays vibrant. Um, what I did do with my containers, it's, I don't know that everybody does this, but you can get um, beneficial nematodes. Uh -huh. um, certain insects lay their eggs in soil and the nematodes will eat the eggs. Oh, okay. And we have a really huge white fly problem out here. It's like these little teeny gnats, and all of a sudden you'll just get this cloud of them billowing out of the Is that soil. That we of saw your... this morning at the camper, at the, cam at the RV site. Oh, they're everywhere. Yeah. It's so bad out here. Yeah. And so, but the nematodes eat the eggs of the white flies, and so I've never had a white oh, fly problem cool. because okay. I, I studied on what I wanted to do with the soil uh, from the get-go. That was like I, one of the first things I studied was soil science. And that's the other thing, because I was doing this for a, a grade in a class, I had to write lesson plans tied to the Common Core and STEM as part of the product, which yeah, I now have wow. on the website. That's awesome. And so I had to learn all these things I didn't already know to write the lesson plans for the kids. Yeah. And so all the things I didn't already know about gardening, 
I was like, well, this is the Common Core standard. I have to, you know. Yeah. And so I learned all these things like soil science. And so I'm like, oh, I need to, you know. And so the nematodes, that came up as a big deal because, like, pest control was a big concern. Right. Um, I have the chicken wire around all of the buckets because of the, we have rats the size of puppies out here. They're wretched. That's what I, but we were from Georgia and we had so many squirrels and the deer. I had, to, I, I always wanted to have, you know, a raised garden in the back portion of our property. But yeah. I, I was intimidated and. You got to put a deer garden by the tree line in order to keep them out of your big garden. I, yeah, yeah. And but, it's like, um, well, how many gardens do I need to maintain? And I ended up having, I just had a, a big row bucket garden on my back deck then. The, but you do have to. Yep. But here in California, there's no squirrels. Oh yeah, they are. If well, you go, hardly. It, it depends on where you bunnies, go. Bunnies. I saw a lot of bunnies. I thought, well, if you there's have tons lettuce. Tons of bunnies <laughs> around here. Tons of with rats yeah. out here are the bigger problem. We do have ground squirrels, but they're not as numerous. But when I was out at the ranch in the high desert, um, right at the snow line between the Alpine Forest and the Mojave Desert, where it goes from Joshua trees to you know big pinyon pines, we had ground squirrels that were just freaking huge oh, wow. and I mean they wouldn't just come up and eat your food out of your bucket they'd flip you off at the same time I mean they were just <laughs> hostile how do you get into the school system is that something that you're are they open to you would think it was curriculum? mostly I thought that's what when we first met talked on the phone a couple years ago it was a like, challenging thing to do because of what I do in special ed law when you file federal complaints against school districts for breaking the law, they tend not to want to invite you in. So, um, oh, that's, that's a bummer. Yeah, so it's like, oh God, we don't want her on the campus, she might see something. I'm like, I'm just here to plant a carrot, whatever. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, get over it. But um, the, I'm in the Kiwanis Club. And the Kiwanis Clubs has its youth memberships organizations. So that's the way you work around it. And so the way I worked around it is I'm not really the one taking it in. Okay. It's the club taking it in, and we have a lady in the club who's a retired teacher who goes around and liaises with all of the school okay. people. Yeah. And I'll come as a guest speaker and present it all, and then I'm out. Right. And, um, and I really, honestly, the whole, my whole goal with all this is to delegate the learning growth stuff to as many people as possible, because I want people copying what I'm doing and teaching others. Yeah. I don't want to be the expert, right, because right, I'm not... Right. It's not proprietary technology. It's not like I'm the expert. I didn't invent anything. And so... But you brought all the information together. I just brought all the information to you. What ours is intellectual property is the curriculum. Okay. So, so. how can we help you, like, if, with um, just promote, help promote, promoting you on Instagram and Yeah, Facebook the social media that. exposure is really helpful. Our yeah. meet, sharing our meetup groups. So I'm starting to get people from, even though it targets L.A., yeah. Urban Gardeners in L.A., we're getting yeah, but, people from all over. Yeah. Because um, so, I went on there, you sent me that link, and it it has an online, you can opt in online. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to be watching. And I set up my um, laptop out here. Oh, that's what Meetup does. I don't, yeah. Yeah, Meetup is, okay. well, Meetup is just a way to do meetings. You can do in person or online. Oh, like Zoom or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's, okay. it's a platform for different types of get togethers. I gotcha. It's okay. like a, a club platform. But then um, how you meet, whether it's in person or online, they've integrated with Zoom and all these other online platforms if you're going to do an online I thing. I gotcha, okay. So I'm doing those classes online, but we've also got our in-person classes through Airbnb experiences that we do out here. Yeah. Um, but not everybody who's doing Airbnb, which are usually the people who come do the experiences, mm -hmm. want to get a bucket full of dirt and take it home. Yeah. And so they may come to the tour, but they won't do the class. Yeah. Um, but I like doing everything through Airbnb because you get a million dollars per event worth of insurance and their whole hosting platform and booking platform and all of the bells and whistles that come with that. So for me, that's a really good tool and it keeps everybody safe um, and it keeps the property owners safe. Um, yeah. But so what's happening is with our meetups is once people realize we've got these in-person classes, after they've gone through our online classes, they'll, since it's mostly greater Los Angeles area, they'll go ahead and drive out here. They'll, they'll, okay. put, they'll sign themselves up and come out here and take a class. Yeah. And so that's starting to happen more. And certainly once we get to the point where we've got the overnight classes, we've got the full on learning center. Because um, once we get the tiny house on wheels, then we'll convert the tent into an overnight spot that can be Airbnb out yeah. for the overnight classes and expand the instruction that way. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're you know, over time. So the more word we get out there, um, for what it is that we're doing, uh, then that's going to help us, you know, uh, not just get the, the instruction out there, 
But the way that we're fundraising to cover our, this nonprofit instruction is through our online store. Yeah. So if we can get people to, if they're going to copy what we're doing, we just ask that they use the links that we've provided for all the same materials that we're using. If they're going to copy us, you know, we'll tell them how, what we're using and how to get it. Um, but if they use our affiliate links, that helps us out a lot because then that becomes revenue to help fund what we're doing right. and cover the cost of operation. Right. Um, so that's a huge part of it. Um, if there's um, other clubs that you encounter, other community service project like Lions or Rotary or other Kiwanis clubs and other people just to point us back to what we're doing and, yeah. and we can share our information because we've got one class on, on the meetups that's specifically about using self-watering container gardening as a community service project which is just sharing what we do through the Kiwanis club yeah um, that other people can copy it and but a lot of people come to the classes already part of a Kiwanis club in their local community like oh and so it's Kiwanis to Kiwanis is really easy yeah somebody else was doing this like Mm -hmm. he, he built his own DIY version and same kind of thing, found the grow bucket and he's like, this is such, this takes the whole obstacle out of it. Right. So he has that option on his web, he's working on his website too. But then if somebody wants to learn how, you could have like a little side thing to show them how to build that. Your, yeah, the your, total DIY yeah, version. Yeah. And for, because we do have an international audience and not everybody can get the grow bucket yeah. kits, we have to still be ha show them. Because the science is the same, no matter right. which way you do it. Yeah. And it's it's not you know, just how you sub-irrigate. Yeah, it's just whether you sub-irrigate. And, um, you know, it, the thing that people need to appreciate, too, is the water conservation piece of it. Regardless of which method you use, it's a tenth of the amount of water to grow in a, in a bucket like this yeah. with a sub-irrigated system than it is to grow it in the ground and have all the water leach right. away into the right. earth. Right. And, um, and so, especially here in California with all the raging debates about water consumption for agriculture. You guys are really on the cusp of, a, you know, a, an issue that is very timely. Yeah, yeah. You, you guys have really, you know, struck a nerve there with all of that. And I think it's really interesting to see how people are starting to think about that. It's the very fact that, um, you know, your developer who created the product was sitting, you know, in his engineering brain, which I totally relate to. Yeah. Um, having a full on, wait. <laughs> Yeah, and, um, and he was frustrated, you know, with what he he tried at all different kinds of gardening. Do you have a do you have an uh, like a rain barrel and an irrigation kit? Not yet. If you had a rain barrel out here, we well, wouldn't have to get it, much rain. I don't get much rain. Yeah, That's the thing. Just, There's not much rain to collect. What I really want to do and what well, I'm thinking gray though, water is idea. yeah. When I get the tiny house on wheels, I, my intention is to use the gray water yeah. to water the garden. Yeah. And so I was just going to connect a hose to the spigot and there do it go. that way. Yeah. So I could do exactly the same kind of a thing rather than hook up the hose. I could just hook up the the irrigation system to that. Yeah. And then I don't even have to deal with it. Right. So I know. So, so that's awesome. Okay. Like, oh, I washed a dish. Oh, I just watered a plant. I don't have to. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that would be way cool. Yeah. Right on. All right. Well, yeah. I appreciate you. I Is appreciate there you. Else that you want to share? Or Gosh, I could go on forever and ever. I think what we're doing right now and just having a real conversation about it. Yeah. But you know, the other cool thing too is just look at the magic of the universe. I started this as a college project in 2013 grow an Instagram following, you find me through hashtags, yeah. you and I start talking from opposite sides of the continent, yeah. and now here you sit on my patio, know, so and cool. we're sitting here having this it. badass conversation about it. all of and this. You never, that's the whole thing, is like connecting, and you, who knows, you know, just always trying to be open to the conversation and then connecting each other to, you know, you've got a lot going on, you've got a lot that you're going to be doing, and so I wish you well with all of that. Thank you. That's the tiny house and all of that, it's just yeah, I mean, yeah, the, 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 the food part of it is one part of a bigger piece, yeah, but it all started with the buckets. The buckets are the foundation of everything we did. <laughs> yeah. And so it's that's always going to be what everything comes comes back down to. Yeah. It's like, how do I tie in the buckets? <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Right, right on. Well, well, thank you. Thank you.